Welcome back to the FeeCast, your weekly dose of economic thinking from your friends at the Foundation for Economic Education. I am Richard Lawrence, and our panel is Brittany Hunter, Dan Sanchez, and Marianne March. And we are back after a brief hiatus for last week. We, many of us, went to Freedom Fest, where you were a finalist for the Reason Young Voices Award. Congratulations Thank for you. that. That's an awesome honor for you. And so today we're going to talk about something somewhat familiar to our audience who have been with us for a while. On FeeCast number five, a couple of months ago, we really started delving into the word socialism. And we had delved previously into other words such as liberal and progressive in the past. But we really dedicated an entire episode to socialism for the reason that it is a very weighty topic. And it's a word that is misused and abused, frankly. Constantly. Very, very often. Constantly, in Mm -hmm. fact. And so the reason we're reviving this conversation today, of course, is there's been some news using that word. Uh, There was a woman named Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez who won a very uh, important victory in a Democratic House primary in New York City. And she is a self-described Democratic Socialist. And she's been making the media circuits recently, going on Stephen Colbert, talking with Margaret Hoover on the new firing line, by the way, which I didn't realize until recently has been revived since the days of William F. Buckley. But she goes on and she talks about a lot of weighty issues, a lot of different things, such as unemployment. In Mm -hmm. fact, she made a gaffe the other day that said, well, the unemployment rate would be much higher if people didn't have to go out searching for second jobs, such as Uber, various other things. The gig economy would probably play into that. And so one of the things that we want to talk about now on this episode is what is democratic socialism? And that's Mm -hmm. our topic today. And so I want to cue you first, Dan, because I think you have a very interesting idea. We were talking right before the show about democratic socialism more as a feeling than as a philosophy. Yeah, I mean, there there are definitions and there are technical definitions for democracy and for socialism. Um, but oftentimes when people are advocating it, they're not really thinking uh, technically that they're more feeling uh, it's it's more of a sentiment than a philosophy, mm. I think. That that it's sort of when when people think of the terms de- democratic socialism, it's more of sort of the associations that it conjures in their mind, mm-hmm. uh, and generally about human welfare, and generally about caring for people, and um, and so the antithesis of democratic socialism, they think of that as the opposite of those sentiments. They think right. of it as selfishness and not caring for your fellow human being, and um, and really, the, it's 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 sort of a um, a challenge for us as advocates of of free markets and uh, and and of capitalism because the very word capitalism. Um, you know, connotes the ownership of capital and, and greed. And it's a dirty word for a lot of people. Yeah. And so a lot of us have had conversations with democratic socialists in the past, self-described. Um, and I wonder if we might take a step back because these people mm-hmm. who call themselves democratic socialists, including Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, mm-hmm. have concerns. Yes. Yeah. I think that people who carry this kind of sentiment, they have reasonable concerns that they can point to. There are a lot of problems that we experience. Um, I know Alexandria, uh, excuse me, Ocasio-Cortez in particular, she worked two jobs right after college. She had student loans to pay back and she and her mother were trying to keep their house from being foreclosed Mm -hmm. after her father Mm -hmm. passed away from cancer. So I completely can see how she would have sympathy for people struggling with student loan debt. I mean, in the United States, 44 million people have student loan debts amounting to 1.5 trillion, and that's increased. Your average person has about $37,000 in student loans, and that's gone up in the last 13 years. And we can look at things like health care. It's very expensive in the United States to care for your health. And when you compare that to what looks like the cost in other countries, it seems like, what are we doing in the U.S.? Other countries look like they're doing it better. Right. And And so it's almost like... If you care about those things at all, it's assumed that, well, you must be favorable of democratic right. socialism. And if you are critical of the policies of democratic socialists, people think that it's because you don't care about those things, that you don't care about the environment, and you don't care about people's health or students' 
being getting out of college with, in some cases, hundreds of thousands of dollars of debt and not being able to find a job. And it goes back to a quote that we talked about last uh, session, I mean, last episode, uh, Frederick Bastiat exactly. said that mm-hmm. people who think that we don't, who, when, when we say we don't want the government to provide these things, uh, socialists assume that we are opposed to those things like healthcare and education. Not only that, but you look at why student loans were able to get so high, why healthcare is such a mess. That is a government controlled system. Both of those things are only possible because of it's not capitalism. Capitalism would provide a much different solution. It is government control of the economy. And also, when you're calculating these things, I don't know that when we look at the Nordic countries, for example, and we talk about their costs for healthcare being lower than the United States, I don't believe that's factoring in the amount that's being spent in tax dollars to pay for health care. Right, right, because that's typically left out of the equation uh, because it's always looking at the wider economy without government investment. But there is something mm-hmm. interesting about what Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez said on uh, mem- maybe numerous shows, including Stephen Colbert, where she said basically, a democratic socialist believes in a country as wealthy as the United States mm-hmm. that no one should be hungry, no one should be without an education, no one should be sick, and of course no mm-hmm. one should go be sick enough that they go bankrupt because of medical Mm -hmm. bills. And so these are legitimate concerns that she's bringing to the table now and trying to find ways to address those through her surprise Mm -hmm. uh, win of the primary. And we have an article about that appearance. It's called The Questions Stephen Colbert Should Have Asked Democratic Socialist Rock Star. Uh, Because that's what the New York Times referred to her as, as a a political rock star. So we have that link underneath the video. But what was that question? Um, Well, a lot of questions about um, how would socialism work mm. in, in practice. That's what our, the author Barry Brownstein um, w- w- was getting at. But really, I mean, the the discussion that she had with Colbert, it was so superficial. It was, and, and it was, again, assuming that um, being for those things, like not wanting people to be too poor to live, she said, mm-hmm. is what democratic socialists believe. But the thing is that that's what classical liberals yeah, I was gonna say, have that's believed what we believe. <laughs> since yeah. the, the 18th uh, yeah. century. Yeah, I certainly don't want people to be in poverty or to be drowning in debt. That's no way to live. And to be fair to her appearance on Colbert... Those shows are not exactly the best venue to go into deep philosophical or (laughs) political discussions. So there is an ability to kind of gloss over these sorts of things, Mm -hmm. but that's why we're talking to you here, and that's why you're watching Mm -hmm. this. (laughs) And so all of us have had opportunities to talk with people who identify this way, democratic socialists. And in Mm -hmm. fact, you, Brittany, you were telling me this really interesting story about a time in college. Yeah, well, it baffles me because, again, we we, I think democratic socialists have this this idea that they are kind of holier than thou, right? Because they care about people. Oh, and and no one else is afflicted by this problem of any other ideological (laughs) persuasion. But during my undergrad, I had, you know, our to have classes with a lot of these people and one one particular student looked at me and he said you know once a week we go out and we shoot guns practicing how to kill you how to kill capitalists essentially and I thought you know how how socially tolerant of you how democratic <laughs> how democratic of you to use that to use that against me but it was a little bit jarring one how angry and I'm not saying all democratic socialists are angry no, of course not. but there seems to be an underlying kind of anger where where there's we're so mad that things aren't all equal that we're right. gonna go this route and it's scary it, it's terrifying in some instances. Well, and, and it's sort of a populist um, emergence uh, of mm-hmm. this trend because really um, the Occupy Wall Street uh, movement, which was mm-hmm. like anger-based. That's like when I was it, in college, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, yes. and it was justifiable yeah. anger. Mm-hmm. Uh, um, there, w- there was a lot of cronyism Absolutely. That, yeah. Was, yeah. that was resulted mm-hmm. in the financial crisis. And, um, and so there were a lot of deep concerns, but they were blaming the wrong people. They were yes. they were blaming capitalists when they really, they should have blamed government. Or at least done mm-hmm. research to see who to blame, but I don't think that w- they just assumed yeah. capitalism. Right. Right. We're going to go a lot more deeply into these ideas in just a second, but I do want to take one moment, because you used a word there, populist. Yes. What is populism? Mm-hmm. Okay, well, po- populist is sort of um, grassroots, so it's sort of like... So it sounds like a good thing. Not necessarily, because um, a lot of times when people get into this mob mentality, there's like an anonymity of of the mob, and it can make them push for really criminal uh, sources of redress that people wouldn't have um, been willing to do if they did in a private individual capacity. Okay, so these are mobs of people getting together, advocating for a certain type of change, and when someone is called a populist, 
generally, I think the other implication there is that they are basically playing to the lowest common denominator, yeah, right? Yeah, demagogue mm-hmm. or a rabble rouser. Right. Mm-hmm. So they can be nationalists, they can be socialists, yeah. they can be of really any particular persuasion. But what it typically ends up in is the person who's advocating for this populist sentiment has more government control over society, over life. Right, because a mirror image of the populist Occupy Wall Street movement was the populist Tea Party Mm -hmm. movement. Exactly. And a lot of that got funneled into the Trump uh, candidacy. So much of it, too much of it. Just as much Mm -hmm. as Occupy Wall Street got funneled into uh, um, uh, Bernie Sanders and Mm -hmm. and now Ocasio-Cortez. Both democratic socialists who we'll talk Mm -hmm. about a little bit more. But we're going to take a quick break. And we'll be right back after those messages. Hi, I'm Sean Malone, Director of Media for Fee.org. Of course, you already know about Fee's incredible articles and written content. But did you know that you can also watch our fantastic videos and listen to our podcast at our website as well? Visit Fee.org slash shows to get the latest content from the series you love, such as Out of Frame, Common Sense Soapbox, How We Thrive, the Words and Numbers podcast, and, of course, the FeeCast. Once again, that's fee.org slash shows for more great content like this. Thanks for watching. Welcome back to the FeeCast. We've been talking about democratic socialism, and one of the most interesting things to me about democratic socialism is how it's socialism that's been modified by democracy. And so it feels to me like it's not quite socialism because it's democratic socialism. It's kind of like all these other terms that we're using today, like environmental justice or social justice, various other things. Uh, Neoliberal would be another one that people in our field would be recognizing. But it's interesting to me because these modifiers end up changing entirely the word that follows them. And so I wonder, democratic socialism we're, we're going to get into this, whether it's actually true socialism, but I'm thinking maybe it's not. Yeah, I mean, it's sort of a modification of a modification because socialism in the first place is sort of like a um, terminological strategic move because when you think of society, that's ev- something that everybody favors, including right. capitalists and, and liberals, That, um, and, but but hanging the word society on your ideology, it gives it sort of like an automatic endorsement. And, um, but then what happened is that what people were calling socialism ended up having a huge death toll and a really bad track record. So in spite of the positive connotation, it started getting a negative connotation. And so then the people, the, the socialists felt like they had to d- distinguish what they were advocating with the bad things that happened in the past, with Stalinism, with Soviet mm-hmm. communism. And they said, okay, well, in the past, socialism was about revolutionary communism where we liquidate the, the capitalists and we overthrow the government and we establish a dictatorship of the proletariat. But this is kinder and gentler. This is democratic socialism. So we don't want tyrants. We don't want uh, authoritarians. We want democracy, and we still want all all the same economic policies, but we want it through democratic means. Right. It's so interesting to me because in the aftermath of World War II, the Social Democrats were some of the biggest uh, and most popular parties in Europe, and that was a time at which Social Democrat basically was somewhat socialist, and now social democrats are identifying themselves as democratic socialists. So the evolution of terms also plays into this. But I think the bottom line here is when people think of socialism, they should not think of something that's particularly social. Socialism mm-hmm. by itself is when the means of production are owned at least full, partially, but many times fully, mm-hmm. by the government. That's the major distinguishing factor here. And so when people talk about democratic socialism as something only that really addresses human welfare needs, they're really misusing the term socialism entirely. Yeah. And especially when you talk about, um, I mean, means of production are part of it, but I think a lot of people associate it with the redistribution of wealth, not realizing Mm -hmm. that the redistribution of wealth is only possible once you've seized the means of production and you have wealth to redistribute. You can't do that without it. So while it is a part, it is not in full you know, what we think of as socialism. Right. And I I think that's why people are able to get away with sort of like the kinder, gentler feelings, because they're emphasizing Mm -hmm. 
the, the redistributors. The, they're emphasizing caring for people and they're glossing over the, uh, the seizing of, exactly. of resources yes. that have, has to happen first. Yeah, you can put lipstick on a pig, but I'm not going to kiss it. <laughs> and I think that you can dress up socialism in any way you want. But at the end of the day, if you're taking things by force, you're not advocating for a policy that's pro-social. And from what we've seen out of history is that the, that's where this always leads. All of the nations that called themselves socialists years later, we're like, oh, but they were communists. They weren't socialists. They weren't doing it right. Right. And you have an article coming out about Simone Bolivar, at least in Bolivia. Yeah. And, and sort of the moniker that the current regime in Venezuela use when they're talking about their socialist revolution that they are still in the midst of is Bolivarian. Bolivarian socialism, mm-hmm. right? And so they've, that's kind of their modifier on socialism. And that is not working out very well for them in the least. Down in Venezuela, like we've spoken about mm-hmm. in the past, starvation, crime, uh, infant mortality. Not, not, and not yeah. just starvation. We're talking people resorting to eating their pets because there's no food. I mean, it's, it's not mm-hmm. even just, oh, people are going hungry, they're skipping a meal. Yeah. I mean, this is horrific. These in are the things case, that we can't imagine. In the case of Venezuela, they were the number one producer of grain not that long ago. There was an article we were talking about uh, from a few years ago in The Nation magazine, uh, and it was entitled Venezuela's Radical Food Experiment. And they mentioned in this another kind of uh, uh, obfuscation of terms, a term called food sovereignty, whereby the implication is that a country should be self-sufficient about its supply of food. And we're seeing this all the time with energy independence is another thing that we've heard about in the United States here. But they haven't quite achieved anything positive from a policy of food sovereignty. No, I mean, you, you really need to be integrated into the division of labor to really uh, be well-fed, that like you can't just um, isolate yourself and expect, I mean, we, we talked about uh, the idea of Wakanda yeah, yeah. being a you know, self-sufficient paradise, um, but really no single country has enough res- natural resources to live the kind of living standards that we've grown accustomed to. The, these living standards were built off of globalization. It was built off of the fact mm-hmm. that, that the, the division of labor has extended throughout the globe because of markets. Um, and, and that is why we're able to have the living standards that yeah. we have. One of our heroes, F.A. Hayek, used to say, the larger the market, the greater the amount of specialization. The bigger the pie, right? That's kind of right. Thing? Yeah. The, the bigger mm-hmm. you can grow the pie yeah. because people can focus on the things they're best at and outsource the things they're not, yeah. which is most of the things that we rely on to live good, healthy, fulfilled lives. I think one of the perhaps mental blocks, we could call it, for democratic socialists is that They think of things that we think of as being good things in our lives, of community and caring for the elderly and cleaning up waste on the street. They think that these things are going to be impossible in a capitalist society because there's no incentives that they can see to do them. And I just think that's not the case. That's right. There's private charity. I mean, they just always assume that in a free society that the only way that we can help each other is if there is payment involved and there's a quid pro quo. But the uh, civil society is much more consistent with a market uh, society th- than it is with, with a, a communist society, that, that um, people actually are a lot less generous. And we have a Barry Brownstein article up about that too, that people mm-hmm. are a lot less generous when, um, when there's a centrally planned economy uh, because there, it's just a lot poorer for one right. thing. That, that, and so people are a lot more grasping with, uh, of resources. Um, and really there's no such thing as coerced charity. And so mm-hmm. like being, uh, having your own things to be generous with is important for generosity. It, it's free will, mm-hmm. right? You're making that decision rather than having it stolen from you and then claim, mm-hmm. claiming charitable acts, yeah. you know? Right. But Dan, I think the first part of, you, of what you said is to me the most crucial, that once we've covered our own needs, that's when we can look beyond ourselves and look to our right. neighbors and help exactly. them with their struggle. But if you're not covering your own needs, then how can you be helpful to anybody else? Put on your own gas or put on your own air mask first, like they say in airplanes. Mm -hmm. That's right. So it always strikes me whenever I'm talking with a socialist or a democratic socialist, the degree to which 
You mentioned charity in civil society, the degree to which charity is mocked mm -hmm. as a way for people mm -hmm. to actually address problems for the poor and disadvantaged. And there's an argument to have, and perhaps we could have another fee cast that goes into this, that charity is uh, far from a panacea. It won't fix every single mm -hmm. solitary thing. You want to have economic growth so people mm -hmm. can end up taking care of themselves in many ways. They can find new ways to serve each other, create value, create wealth. But it always strikes me just how much the idea of charity is put down from among those people who mm -hmm. believe that the state is the only actor yeah. who can participate well, fully in that kind of stuff. I wonder if those people have ever been the beneficiaries of charities themselves, because I think the people who have benefited from those kinds of private charities would, would say differently. I think they would say that they were helped in times of need and they're grateful for it. Yeah. So and switching it, gears for just a second, mm -hmm. I wanted to mention again that, that article that you're writing now, because I think that one of the problems that we have in our in our discourse is that a lot of the countries that we assume are socialist, like those countries in Scandinavia that we constantly hear they can make socialism work, but a lot of those countries that we call socialist or at least perceive that way aren't actually socialist. And no. Bolivia is one that you're working on yeah, right now. Yeah, um, so a lot of socialists or democratic socialists right now are trying to say socialism works because Bolivia's economy is thriving. But when you look at the numbers and you actually take a look at why Bolivia's economy is, is thriving, it's because they've been able to find loopholes in which capitalism can still exist. The black market is able to thrive. The drug war has been de-escalated. So all these different things are coming to part or to coming to play where the economy is able to boom because of capitalism sneaking through the cracks, not because of socialism. This is interesting. Didn't Murray Ross Rothbard say something. About I believe, yeah, capitalism breathes through loopholes. Was the Ludwig von Mises? Actually. Oh, was it Mises? Mises? Said that. Okay, yes. <laughs> and that's an interesting idea. So it doesn't matter how many restrictions you put in place, as long as there are ways for people to kind of circumvent those they can end up producing happy, healthy, fulfilled lives. Yeah, the market finds a way. And there's even an example in when, you know, peak communism in China, that there were still farmers able to sell their extra crops, you know, on the side mm -hmm. in black markets because they had to. So when you have to do that to thrive, the market finds a way. Markets are everywhere. The question is yeah. to what degree and if they're small time or if they're able to be big and actually serve the great mass of people. Yeah. So mm -hmm. we're going to talk a little bit more about this in a few minutes, but we're going to take a quick break and we'll see you after that. Boy, you know, starting out in the, in the music business or in just any business, you have to have the carrot dangling. You have to know what your goals are. I think if anybody goes in without a goal, you're pretty much doomed. This is a family business. Our daughters, our son-in-law, my brother. We, we, we can't walk away from this. This is not something we walk away from. This is something we pass on. I mean, you're always going to run into the wall. It's just, can you figure out how to go under it, around it, uh, over it? That makes for longevity of a, of a business. You can't give up. You just don't let yourself give up. Watch Mama Goldtone and more documentaries about women in business in our How We Thrive series at fee.org slash shows. Welcome back to the FeeCast. We've talked a little bit about the meaning of words, the history of some of these words, and we've talked about sort of the, the contemporary importance of them. One of the questions that I want to throw your way now, Brittany, is in your opinion, what would a democratic socialist society actually look like? Chaos. I, I mean, it doesn't. It, it doesn't even Mince work no that words. way, right? Yeah. I think of Stalin. I think of Lenin when I'm thinking this because I'm thinking of a really loud group of people trying to impose what they believe, which socialism, right? Uh, you know, owning the means of production, right? On people who don't necessarily care about it, now, people who aren't necessarily, you know, proponents of this idea. But you have this very loud and sometimes violent group coming into power with these really loud ideas. So it's not going to be some peaceful utopia because at the end of the day, everybody on this panel is not going to agree with it, and we're going to have to be forced into this system. And not only on this panel, but on the street. On the streets, not yeah, anywhere exactly. else, there are always going to be divergent opinions. Exactly. And when Milton Friedman talks about democracy, he, he uh, associates it with political freedom. And one of his points is that you cannot have political freedom without economic freedom. Because if you concentrate, if you have truly the ownership of the means of production in the government hands, then that is a huge concentration of power because mm -hmm. you can determine what, what everyone does. You can de determine like how, how much everyone is compensated. You determine where they work, if they work in Siberia versus if they work in Moscow. Mm -hmm. um, that, that kind of concentration of power is not consistent with, with the democracy. Right. And so Milton Friedman would say he knows of no place where 
a country has been wealthy and prosperous where there has not been economic freedom mm -hmm. because you can't have political freedom with economic without economic freedom yeah. and every prosperous society has a great measure of both and i think that's why we're seeing such tyranny in venezuela um, it's it, so a lot of democratic socialists say well that's not real democratic socialism, that's not real socialism because our idea of socialism is where people are free to have dissent. Um, but, but when the central government in Venezuela controls rationing how much people eat, I mean, they, they even have like these um, plastic bags of food that are only allocated to good, good standing members of, of, the, of the Communist Party. When, when you have that kind of control, there's, there's no real freedom of dissent. There's no real political freedom. No, and it kind of reminds me of, you see these people on college campuses very loudly, you know, championing censorship. A lot of these same people are democratic socialists that mm -hmm. are trying to keep, you know, right-wing people off their campus because they disagree with them. So where's the dissent? You know, where is that conversation happening? Right. And another point I think is that crisis leads to centralization Absolutely. of power. Absolutely, yep. <laughs> and, and when you have these food crises and, and when you have the kind of poverty uh, that socialism breeds, that really lends power to the state, to the central state, and really um, diminishes political freedom also. Yeah. And of course, when you say Stalin and Lenin, that's of course outside of the minds of anyone who <laughs> believes themselves mm -hmm. to be a democratic socialist. But you're saying that it's inevitable, mm -hmm. that if you want to achieve a socialist society, that you have to have a great deal of censorship, great deal of repression mm -hmm. of people who disagree with the regime as it's pursuing its policy, right? of yeah. enforcement of executive power. And so we might not, as democratic socialists, if we were, <laughs> think that we were going in that direction, but there's really mm -hmm. no other way to go. Yeah. Once you start controlling the economy, where can you stop? Because you start controlling it, it's not going to work. And then all you can do is attempt to add more controls or say, oops, that was a mistake. And once you have power, who's going to give it up? Yeah, Ludwig von Mises, in an essay that we have on fee.org called uh, Middle of the Road Policy yeah. Leads to Socialism, mm -hmm. makes that point that there's always going to be bad uh, side effects of every, every intervention. If you try to fix those with new interventions, then those create more side effects, and mm -hmm. it just mounts until you have complete socialism. So wait, let's take a step back, because again, there's a difference between this socialism, as we've described it, and sort of the idea of the welfare state, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So the concerns of democratic socialists include high health care costs, yes. high costs for education, including college mm -hmm. education, um, poverty, inequality, and all the problems mm -hmm. that destruction stem... Destruction of the environment. Destruction of the environment, mm -hmm. right. So they're not actually talking about government controlling the means of production. Why is democratic socialism of the welfare variety the slippery slope that you guys are talking about? Because, like, like as we've seen, that um, in healthcare, for example, that we've we've had massive interventions, especially since the New Deal, in the healthcare industry, and it mm -hmm. and it has led to really skyrocketing costs, and it is those costs that has been the um, impetus for Obamacare, and now we have the failure mm -hmm. of Obamacare, saying, oh well, we need nationalized healthcare, we need single payer healthcare, and. Um, and so as long as you pursue the internal logic of the welfare state, ultimately it leads to socialism. I want to make sure we're absolutely clear on mm -hmm. what you just said, Dan. Previous interventions by the government mm -hmm. into these areas, such as health care, mm -hmm. have caused the crises that we are still dealing with today in those areas. Exactly. And then call for more intervention, mm -hmm. which leads to more crises, which calls for more intervention, and so on. But on, on that note, speaking of, you know, capitalism surviving through free loopholes, I, I wrote an article a couple weeks ago about medical tourism. Right. People are now leaving the country and getting cost better care at lower mm -hmm. costs. Mm -hmm. So even, even amongst the government screw-ups and how they're making it worse, there's still elements of the market that are able to peek through and consumers are able to find those. And what's beautiful about that is that actually delivers on the promise that Marxists pretend to, to offer. That that is actual uh, the the democracy of the market. Mises calls it mm -hmm. consumer sovereignty. Mm -hmm. That every consumer votes with their dollar, and what they, all the different consumers can have lots of different plans that mesh with each other yeah. and that that coordinate through the the very intricate market system. Whereas the brute top down centralized system that leads to tyranny because. Mm -hmm. 
ultimately you have to have a strong man determining one direction yeah. for the economy when you have central planning. Yeah. You can't have lots of different people having different plans when the government owns the means of yeah, production. Yeah, see how well that worked out for Stalin and like yeah. people under yeah. Stalin and Lenin. Yeah. And <laughs> even even if you were to start out with a benevolent dictator or a benevolent group of controllers, how long are those people going to last before they get knocked out by a stronger man and mm -hmm. a more violent man? Right. And so there is sort of a timeline of how, let's say, we want to have more affordable health care. There's a timeline of in intervening on that, and then slowly, surely but slowly, we become actually socialist, right? The government must at some point, after intervening time after time to make these little mm -hmm. tweaks here and there, the government must at some point say, Let's take it over entirely. And we've seen that with single payer, right? So people are saying Obamacare didn't go far enough. Now we need single payer. We can't right. have mm -hmm. a mixture of private and public. It has to be, you know, all be government. Yeah. Where's that going to lead us? The fact of the matter is the central planning and the control, it doesn't work. I was a lefty in college. You may have called me a democratic socialist back in the day. And the reason that I changed my mind is because I learned and I realized that to get what I want, to get people out of poverty, this is not the way. The way is through free markets. Yeah, and, and it's because you went beyond sentiment. You you went mm -hmm. on to philosophy. You you went beyond just like assuming that um, that that if you're a good person, then of course you you want socialism. Mm -hmm. So like, okay, I I don't want to just seem you know virtuous. I want actual results. Yeah. I want a system that actually works for poor people. And once you like actually understand economics, then you understand that the market does. And so mm -hmm. I'm curious a little bit more about your transformation mm -hmm. there. So yes. once you started really studying history, philosophy, mm -hmm. economics, you started to understand that for the things that you wanted, the market process, mm -hmm. a free and civil society would work better. Right. So I studied public policy in school. I graduated from Georgia State University. And we talked a lot about policy and how how to intervene, what that actually looks like. And I thought that, well, we've got science. We've got these beautiful charts that show me if we intervene here, if we manipulate the market here, then this is going to be the outcome. But there was a whole lot of unseen factors that I, as my college student writing, you know, a five page paper wasn't thinking about and couldn't think about because I don't know everything. The pretense of knowledge, I believe. Yes, right, absolutely. Calls it. Yeah. And so when we talk about the market process, we're talking about the ultimate in individual determination, right? We're mm -hmm. talking about individuals all throughout the society actually selecting what, for example, to purchase, what not to purchase, mm -hmm. uh, which places to patronize, um, how to live their lives according to what they want to achieve, which is far different and is, in fact, a bottom-up solution to the problems mm -hmm. of society that we know that we face and much, much different than some politician or bureaucrat saying, this is the way it must be. This is the way the problem must be addressed. Right. And in that system, the again, the consumers are sovereign and even the capitalists, even like the richest capitalist ultimately is uh, a servant of that person insofar as he is a producer in his consumer role. Then he switches his hat to, to be sovereign. Um, and um, but but ultimately, everyone as a producer is serving each other as consumers. And they do it so rapidly, too. Amazing how quickly a company will actually respond to a problem much more quickly mm -hmm. yeah. than the Congress or mm -hmm. even the <laughs> local oh, town yeah. hall. Yeah. I had a problem just a couple of weeks ago with Southwest with my flight leaving late, and I sent them a mean tweet. And they were back to me within 24 hours, like, I'm so sorry about your issue. They go out of their way to make me happy. And Without they don't a work me. for the DMV or the post yeah. office? Oh, oh my goodness, <laughs> uh, No, they yeah. told me to get another line. And all you get from your congressman is a letter six to eight weeks later that's Thank you. written out of <laughs> yeah. a form yeah. template. Yeah. Well, this has been an awesome conversation. <laughs> we'll pick it up next week. We'll talk more about these ideas and others on the FeeCast. We'll see you then. <laughs>